freedom is when I wake up in the morning and I get to choose how my day looks like. And I get to choose who do I want to spend time with? What is my community of choice? And where do I live? I think it forces you to take ownership on your choices. It's like it, nothing is structured. Everything you do is a choice. And then you live a life that is very mindful. Today's most interesting real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and world travelers. And learn the strategies and tactics they use to succeed. And now, here's your host, Matt Bowles. Hey, everybody, it's Matt Bowles. Welcome to the Maverick Show. My guest today is Adi Cohen. She is a location independent entrepreneur, architect, and founder of The New Movement, an architecture studio that designs one-of-a-kind projects worldwide. Her design approach aims to fuel creativity and promote well-being. Her projects have included a hotel in Japan, a yoga retreat center in Guatemala, a tropical bar in South America, a restaurant in Seattle, and the list goes on. Originally from Israel, Adi is now a full-time itinerant nomad with no base and travels the world with carry-on luggage only. She uses her travels as a source of inspiration, a way to connect to ancient wisdom and learn from local communities. Adi, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. I am so excited to have you here. This is going to be such an awesome conversation. Let's start, though, by setting the scene, because you and I have agreed that this is going to be a wine-induced conversation, even <laughs> though we are in very different time zones today. <laughs> so it is before noon my time. I'm just going to say that. So it is the morning. But nonetheless, I have just opened a bottle of Pinot Noir from Northern California that I am going to be drinking through during this episode. I am based in Asheville, North Carolina today on the East Coast of the United States. And where are you and what are you drinking? <laughs> okay, so I'm currently in Israel in Haifa, which is a city up north. And I'm drinking Israeli red wine named Tavo, which is really good. Well, cheers, cheers. to you. So wonderful to have you here. <laughs> and we're going to be drinking through this throughout the episode. So let's just start off, though, with your upbringing and your background. Can you talk a little bit about where you grew up and as you were growing up, how did your interest in architecture or I guess the maybe even just the precursor kind of creative tendencies that would lead you to architecture, how did those develop in your childhood? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I grew up in Israel. I come from a very special family, you might say. My mom is this very positive person and she always allowed us to express ourselves in the most creative ways. For example, when I was a little girl, I had one wall in my room where I was allowed to draw on and just make a lot of mess, which I think helped me to be a creative person. Because when you're allowed to express your artistic side and it's just like unravel some things in you. Yeah, absolutely. So then as you grew up, talk a little bit about how did then your path to architecture take place and also how your interest in travel took place? Because I feel like there's a lot of architects that do a good bit of traveling. And for some people, it's sort of the study of architecture and different types of architecture, which inspires one to travel. And in other cases, it's people start traveling and from the travel, they get interested in architecture. So I would love to hear sort of which way that worked for you and how that evolved. So, yeah, my first international travel was when I was 18, I flew to India. And I think my interest in architecture started when I had interest in people, because the thing that I find fascinating the most about architecture is the way that it impacts human beings. So then, you know, when you travel, you can really tell the difference between different places. And while some places are very inviting, other places make you feel uncomfortable. And it got me thinking, like, how does it happen? Like, what about a certain place makes us want to spend time in it or not? How come 
some places makes me feel more creative and I, and I have like a really good mood and I started to pay attention to the details. And then when I came back from traveling, I decided that I want to create this kind of places for people. So I like, if you asked me before, I had like zero idea of like famous architects names, uh, everything, like nothing about like trendy architecture at all. My interest comes from like, let's say bottom up from the people, from like the way we use the space, from the way that architecture really influences our lives. So let's talk a little bit about that time that you spent in India. You were 18. And can you talk a little bit about where you went in India, how long you spent in India at that age, and what were some of the the highlights or the transformative moments in India that really shaped your life trajectory? So I went to India twice. The first time was when I was 18. It was <laughs> just one week after graduating high school and my parents completely freaked out. It was a spontaneous trip. An older friend of mine just invited me to come with him. And then another two friends came along. So we flew to India, four people. But then after one month, we split up and I found myself alone in India in the age of 18. And at that time, I was not familiar with the concept of solo traveling. I was not solo at all, right? You're a teenager, you're about people and about having your group of friends everywhere with you. And I even remember looking at people sitting by themselves in cafes and thinking like, oh, they don't have any friends. How how sad. But then being in India by myself. I had this defining moment. I remember calling my sister and crying over the phone, like I'm alone and it didn't work out and I don't know what to do. And I don't even know where to go because no smartphones back then. We were just using Lonely Planet to decide where to go. And I decided I'm going to give it a try. And that experience really changed my life and the way that I see solo traveling. It got me to go out of my comfort zone in meeting new people and starting conversations and having friends from all over the world. And the one thing that I love about India, I feel like it's like this best case scenario, right? Because India is really cheap. So when you go there, you actually get to live your life as if you're a millionaire. So now you have all the money and all the time in the world. What do you do with your time? Right. Like some people go hiking, some people go to parties, some people go to do yoga and volunteer with orphans. Like, how do you choose to spend your time when you have no limit? And this is like a very meaningful journey of self exploration. I recommend it (laughs) to anyone to have this time out from, let's say, the, the normal path, you know, the script that we're all been, not us, but A lot of people have been following in their lives and just take a moment and think what is important to you. How do you want to spend your time? Are you a morning person? Are you a night person? Like what are the things that are interesting for you? And then have time practicing it. That's awesome. So I've been to India twice as well, although I have not spent as much time in India as you have. And I would actually love to hear some of the places that you went and how long you ended up spending there in total across both of your trips and what some of your experiences were like. So I went twice. I've been to Delhi. I've been down to Agra to see the Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. I've been to Mumbai. And then I went to Kerala in the south and spent some time there. And then I went to Punjab in the north. And I went to the Golden Temple in Amritsar and got to see all that and hang out with the Punjabis. So that's sort of the extent to which I've experienced India, which for some people, if they haven't been, might sound like that's a lot of India. But India is so enormous Mm. that it's actually only a small (laughs) piece of India. But I would love to hear in total across both of your trips, how long did you spend in India combined? And what were some of the highlights in terms of the places that you went? So the first trip was four months. And the second one was one year. (laughs) That was when I discovered one-way traveling, right? When you get a one-way ticket, then you just go until you had enough. So then the second time it took me one year before I was ready to leave India. And I went through like a whole different scenes on that journey. So I started traveling the North, being around the Himalayas and getting to know like the Tibetan refugee area, like Dharamsala and the Speedy Valley and Kinor. And then I went to Goa, Kodai Canal, Chennai, Calcutta. I spent a few months in Sikkim, which was really meaningful to me because then I became interested in Buddhism. And I found myself, you know, waking up at 4 a.m., climbing up mountains to sit with monks and meditate. 
Yeah. And then I met this guy and he had an amazing piece of jewelry, a necklace. And I asked him, whoa, where is this from? What's the story about this piece? And uh, he told me that he'd been to some tribal areas uh, near to Kolkata. So I went there and apparently there's a, a market that every Friday, all the villages that lives around, they come to this market and they just like sell and buy whatever they need. And then if you connect with them, they'll invite you to come back to their village. So I did that. And I was in this amazing village of Sufi musicians and <laughs> it called Shanti Nikatan, which is like really middle of nowhere. We were, <laughs> uh, we were staying in this huts made of mud and just spending time with the family and, and like the whole community where we were like, all of them are musicians there and we were just playing together. How would you say that your time in India impacted you overall, both in terms of personal growth, right? Particularly at a young age mm -hmm. and also in terms of architectural inspiration and the direction you were going to go professionally. What would you say were some of your primary takeaways or lessons from that period of travel? I guess the one thing you have to learn in India is how to be part of whatever is going on around you, because a lot of the time is chaos and you have to really get to know yourself, to know, to decide where to go. How long do you want to stay there? How do you spend your time? Like we said before, I found myself doing some jewelry design because I felt like I want to learn some local crafts. Yeah. It mostly opened my mind about different ways you can live your life. When you meet so many people from all around the world, it's just this overwhelming experience of how things can be. When I came back from India, the reason I came back to Israel, it's because my hands started itching and not because I had a rash or anything like that. I just felt like I have to create something and I didn't know what. And then I started working with this artist making porcelain lamps. And I kept thinking like, what do I want to create in my life? What is the thing that I want to create? Because I was anti-university back then. I was like, I'm a student in the university of life, right? I don't need to, to have a degree. If I want to learn anything, I'll just find a, a master and learn from him or her. And then when I realized I want to do architecture, it really pushed me into like the ordinary path of going to university. Can you talk about that a little bit? What was it that, you know, you were obviously a creative person and you were artistic and all of that, but what was it that made you decide to go the architecture path specifically? And then what was that path uh, like for you? I'm a person who loves people. I love human beings. I love their stories. I think if I wasn't an architect or an anthropologist, I would probably be some sort of therapist. And then the thing that I wanted the most was to create that kind of places that are, they have a healing effect on people. I know it sounds really hippie, but it's true. I was very much into sustainable design back then. And I was uh, traveling between um, ecological communities in Israel and in India. And it always looked not good enough. If you want to have a house that is self-sustained or it's built from natural materials, why does it have to look like a kid built this building? I thought to myself, there must be a better way of doing that. My original wish was to build sustainable homes. And then when I got to architecture university, I, I completely fell in love in architecture. It was so easy for me. I never imagined it would be so easy. When I'm being asked to design a project, I can see the whole project in my head. All I have to do is like draw it or, you know, model it so somebody else can see what I see. But I have the whole thing in my head immediately. And it's crazy. <laughs> wow. And so from there, what was your path in architecture? Did you work in a traditional office environment doing architecture for a company or, yeah. you know, prior to founding your own business, what was your path and experience leading up to that? So yeah, I did university. It's five years in Israel. And then you have to do an internship that is three years. I was offered a job in a very good firm in Israel. And then I became a partner in a different firm. And I worked 
all in all seven years in like the traditional, the normal practice of architecture. But it felt like it's not enough. Well, in university, you get to do all sorts of creative things and you get to reinvent anything you want. Then when you get to like the real world, to adult life, it's just, it's a lot of bureaucracy, not enough creative time. And I think a lot of the architecture in Israel is profit oriented, which is great. Like profit is important in real estate, but we just copycat buildings and it's not right. (laughs) So when you were having those feelings, right, I'm curious now also about your entrepreneurial tendencies, Mm -hmm. right? Because there's a lot of creatives, right, that have amazing creative visions that are beyond, you know, the norm and all of that. But there's a big difference between that and being able to start and run a business, as an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious about, you know, how that evolution was for you and how that transition was for you when you had the creative inspiration that you wanted to do more and you wanted to do different things and you wanted to have more creative control to pursue the type of architecture that you were passionate about. But then how did the entrepreneurial side of things come into that for you and your choice to actually start your own business? Can you talk about that process and what it was like? Yeah, sure. So I already started doing my own projects while I was working at the firm. Actually, (laughs) I met my first client in an elevator, which is a very funny story because you know how they always say you have to have an elevator pitch. Well, (laughs) it was... (laughs) So then I ended up designing a house for him. So I had a few projects already on my own, but the most interesting thing happened when I gave up architecture. It's a bit dramatic, but it's true. When I started traveling full-time, one way going nomadic, I had no idea if I'm still going to be practicing architecture. I had a few projects in Israel and then I worked on them remotely with my local partners. But I was willing to give up the idea of being an architect because I looked at the lifestyle and I just understood that there's no way in hell I can work nine to five in an office for the rest of my life. Like I couldn't imagine how living a nomadic lifestyle is going to work with being an architect. But then as I traveled, I met people and those people asked for my help. For example, the first international projects I had was a hotel in Japan. So I met this couple from New Zealand and they just bought a hotel (laughs) and we met and they were like, oh, you're an architect. This is amazing. Can you do a consult session for us? And I was so surprised. Like, why would they ask me? Japan has amazing architects. Why would they ask me this random Israeli girl to help them design their hotel? But apparently there's a culture gap and you know it. Like when people have this kind of like a global mindset, and they want to do a project in a certain country, you have to have a mediator. What happened there is that they invited a Japanese architect and they told him, listen, this is not working and we want to do this and that. They were thinking about canceling the lobby, all the common areas of the hotel, because nobody ever sat there. And they wanted just to make more rooms. And he told them it's a good idea because in Japan, you never disagree with your client, right? If you express your opinion to anyone, they will agree with you because it's polite. But me, (laughs) being Israeli, I have no problem expressing my opinions. And I immediately told them that this is a bad idea. And then I offered them how to rearrange the floor in a way that people will see the lobby because it was hidden somewhere in the back. And then later on, I would want to spend time in it and have the whole guest experience and having interaction with the other guests and sitting by the fire and everything else. So then that was the first international project I got. And it got me thinking, is there a need for somebody like me? And then when it happened again and again and again, I just realized that this is my opportunity. That's amazing. So first of all, I got to ask you, because I love Japan. I got to ask you, where in Japan was the project and how much time did you spend in Japan around that project? So in total, I was in Japan three months. 
because I love Japan. They almost had to kick me out, get a 90 day visa <laughs> on the 87th day. I was like, oh no, I have to fly somewhere else. I don't want to go. Um, <laughs> so, and then uh, the project is in a very beautiful, beautiful ski town called Nozawa Onsen. It's in uh, Nagano, if you know this area. So I've been to Japan three times and I have not yet been skiing in Japan, oh, but it is you must go legendary. There. I mean, it's like an international ski destination and I, it's so high on my list because I haven't been there in season to go skiing. I've spent about a month in Tokyo. I've spent about a month in Kyoto and then I've spent about a month in Osaka mm. as a base. And then I've traveled around a bit, you know, out to the islands and to Hiroshima and to some other places. But uh, skiing in Japan is probably by my next trip because I've heard it's just unbelievable. Oh, my God, Matt, you have to go there. I'm going to make it even more irresistible for you. Are you ready? <laughs> so in Nozawa Onsen, it's not only a ski resort town. They have 13 natural springs spread around the town. It's used as a public bath. You're probably familiar with the concept of onsens, right? Yes, but you should explain it to the people that have not been okay, to Japan okay. or are not familiar <laughs> with it. I have been to an onsen and I've stayed in the ryokans mm. and, and it's just an amazing experience. But go ahead and explain it for people that don't know. Oh my God. Japanese people, they're just amazing. Okay. So like the proper way to end your day in Japan is to have a very, very, very thorough shower clean yourself, and then soak in hot water. In the countryside where you have natural springs, it's called onsens. And then in the city, it's called sento. And it divided to men and women and you go naked and it's amazing. It's the best experience ever. So I highly, highly recommend people to go to Japan and go to onsens. That's so awesome. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this travel lifestyle. So you started to travel as a full-time itinerant nomad, and then you developed this concept of becoming a nomad architect after you started your travels. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Let's maybe start talking about the travel thing then, because I'm really curious what inspired you to, because I also am, as you know, a full-time mm -hmm. itinerant nomad with no base and I do the same exact thing, but so I'm super curious because most people don't do that. You know, most people I would say have a base or they're semi-nomadic or they travel a lot or whatever. So giving up the home base and being a full-time itinerant nomad is a super interesting choice that you and I both made. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious from your perspective, what was it that led you to choose to travel and live in that particular way? Yeah. So, you know, traveling the world was always a dream of mine. I always had this wish to be in different places and I wanted to physically be there. I wanted like to know how it feels like to have tea in a traditional Japanese home. I wanted to know how it feels like to walk the streets of Marrakesh, but having this or ordinary lifestyle of being an architect, all I could do is go for like a week or 10 days vacation and then back to the office. And I always wanted to create a this kind of lifestyle where you don't need a vacation from. At this point, I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to give it a try. And I moved a few apartments. Uh, what happened is that uh, me and my partner, we broke up. And then a very dear friend of mine passed away. And I really remember sitting in my apartment and thinking to myself, you know what, like, what the hell? I'm just going to go for it. Like, this is what I want to do. I know I don't have a fixed plan yet. But I have enough money for a few months and I have my projects running in Israel where I can, you know, do them remotely and I'll just go for it. And, you know, after you move a few apartments, you just realize from time to time that you don't need so much stuff. Like I hated all my belongings every time I had to carry them up and down the stairs. I was like, why do I have all this crap? Like, what do I really need? And I minimized it and minimized it. And, you know, after one year of traveling, I came back to Israel for my sister's wedding and I left even more things behind because then I realized I can travel with a carry on and not have a full backpack. So, yeah, just kind of like following that wish to be in different places. That was my motivation to travel. That's awesome. And the other thing that you and I have in common is that we both travel with carry on luggage mm -hmm. only. 
And my experience was exactly the same as yours, right? I left the United States and the first year I certainly was not carry on only, right? I, like I was actually <laughs> lugging around an enormous <laughs> amount of luggage. I mean, I was just, it was ridiculous how much luggage I was bringing with me. And then over the course of that year, exactly what you just said, right? I mean, I had all of these realizations about minimalism and I started to strategically minimize uh -huh. my possessions and was able to get it all down to carry on luggage after year one. And now I do, I mean, I do like, you know, workshop presentations about traveling the world with carry on luggage and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazingly liberating psychologically to be able to realize that all of the physical possessions in the world that you need can fit into a piece of carry on luggage. Yeah. And then you can just focus your life on experiences and people and amazing places and all that. For me, it was really, really transformative. Yeah, go team carry on. <laughs> go team carry on. Absolutely. Uh, and I've interviewed a number of people on the Maverick show as well that do the carry on only thing as well. But I would love to hear your tips on that for carry on luggage and particularly for women. Mm -hmm. Any tips that you have in terms of strategic packing hacks or how to do the carry on only travel thing? Well, first of all, let's admit it. We're always following the sun. So up until now, because I'm, I'm in Israel because of the pandemic, it's the first winter I'm going to experience in years. <laughs> because when you always chase the warm weather, then you can only uh, pack very light. So this is like one thing that helps. You know what? Let's put it this way. So my brother has recently started living a nomadic lifestyle. And I helped him through the process of letting go of his apartment and selling his stuff and deciding what to pack. And we did this exercise together but before leaving his apartment. He packed everything he thought that he needed. And for one week, he needed to report to me what are the items that he's using. <laughs> and then anything that you don't use, <laughs> you know what? And inspired by this, I did the same uh, because I'm designing a tiny house for somebody here in Israel. And he's also going through like the same experience of like, I want to have less things and I want to have more experiences rather than like property. And we did the same, you know, I, I gave him this homework where for one week he has to write down everything that he used, including like kitchen and dishes and everything. And then Everything that is not on the list, he cannot take with him to the tiny house. That's amazing. But that's so correct, right? Yeah. I mean, the amount of things that you actually need, first of all, is way... I mean, for people that live in a house full time, I mean, uh, you know, you can only imagine how many things in your closet mm -hmm. that you just, you know, certainly haven't used in the last six months. I mean, it's just like enormous, yeah. right? Yeah. And, you know, when whenever you're deciding, I'm sure you know this as well, but whenever you want to, I don't know, buy a new t-shirt or uh, for me, a skirt or something like this, then it's always like <laughs> the number one question is uh, how tiny does it fold? <laughs> I think that's the other thing about carrying luggage that's great is it actually forces you to limit your material uh, acquisition of items, yeah. right? And because you can only buy what you can fit in your carry-on. So if you want to buy something new, typically you have to use it to replace something that's currently in your carry-on, mm -hmm. right? Unless it's like super small and you can fit it. But it really makes you think differently about consumption and purchasing Absolutely. material items when you have forced yourself to confine your material possessions to that kind of a space. We can only imagine as women, sometimes we use shopping as uh, some kind of like an emotional tool, you know, when we eat, like sometimes you go shopping when you're bored or when you're lonely or being in different places. There is absolutely no need to get any souvenir because you have to carry it with you forever. So you really think about what are you buying and then the amount of time, the, the amount of free time that I have ever since I don't, you know, sometimes I go window shopping just because I like to see new things <laughs> and I don't know, like chat, touch different materials, but actually I don't need anything. So let me ask you this too, from a business perspective, sure. you began realizing that you could find work as you were traveling and then what was the process to founding your company and creating your architecture firm like can you talk a little bit about just the actual entrepreneur 
business building aspect of that and then how you were able to find additional clients like since your projects are all over the world what does your marketing look like how do you get your offering and your value proposition in front of your target market how did you build that Mm -hmm. yeah sure so a lot of the first clients i had uh we just randomly met in places which was really magical and really weird at the same time then i realized that i have to do my part of the deal you know i build a website and i got being part of this global network of world citizens, of nomads. Uh, People got to know me and my work and a lot of word to mouth was just the beginning of how people got to know me. And then, you know, being an architect usually requires you to stay in one place, right? Like traditionally. So what I did is that I do a lot of concept development, which means that I take the beginning of the project between us, you know, just the most interesting part of the project, which is like, how do you transform the idea into the actual space? And this is the kind of process that I do with my clients. And then once we have the design, I collaborate with local architects that execute the design, that take care of the permits and the bureaucracy. Like anyway, you have to have a local on the construction site. And then just, you know, managing this firm and having let's say my staff, I have a team that is completely remote and then I'm not limited to the people that are around me. Let's say if I have a firm in Tel Aviv, then I have to hire people from Tel Aviv. But since I work remotely, I can just hire people from wherever, just based on their talent and their skills instead of their location. So then I can get really talented people to work with me on my projects and also scale the team according to the project which is amazing. It's it's a lot of freedom as a business owner to do something like this. Yeah. So can you talk about how you've done that in terms of staffing? Do you have staff that works for your firm consistently on all of your different projects? And then you have specific site-based staff that are on location in each project. How does your the structure of your firm look in that sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I have some of the team is permanent, but they're not my employees, right? We work on a freelancer base. But since they're so good, I keep hiring them for more and more projects. And it also depends on their expertise, right? Because if I'm doing, uh, let's say, a project in a certain technique, I would like to have architects that are familiar with this technique to work with me on this project. I have uh, graphic designers and 3D renderers, people who work with me, 3D modeling people. And well, on site, it really depends on the country, but I do have local architects with their teams who are executing my designs and I oversee it. And how much time do you personally need to spend on the ground in these locations? And notice I said need, because I know like (laughs) if you have a project in Japan, you're definitely spending all 90 days there (laughs) just because you want to hang out in Japan. (laughs) But like in terms of your actual work, right? Like meeting with the client on the ground or actually seeing the project site yourself or doing work on location, Mm -hmm. how much time do you actually need to be there for each one of these projects? Mm -hmm. It's funny because for some of my projects, I never been to the property because I can also design remotely. Like, sure, it's wonderful if they have a budget and they can fly me in and I can spend a week or two and see and get familiar with the property and the area. But honestly, we can do a lot of this research online. Even here... I'm currently in Israel and we're doing this eco hotel in the desert. Yeah, sure. I've been on the site. I walked around. I spent a few hours there, but to really get the data that I need, like the wind direction and like the statistics of the climate and everything, I find this information online. Right. So honestly, just to get like the spirit of the place, it's wonderful to be on site. I love meeting my clients in person, but I can also do a lot of it remotely. But then when the construction starts, I do love to go every now and then and see how it goes. But it also depends on where I am in the world and how good do I know the local team? How much do I trust them to execute exactly what I asked for? Because sometimes, you know, people kind of like take their own liberty to adjust the design. And I want to make sure it doesn't happen. So I also want to ask you about your branding, Mm -hmm. right? 
because a lot of location independent companies would maybe just brand themselves in a particular way in terms of the service that they offer. And then they just happen to run them while traveling the world, but that's not necessarily part of their company brand, Mm -hmm. right? Their lifestyle has not been merged with their brand per se. Whereas you really leaned into the nomadic lifestyle and positioned yourself as the nomad architect and you built that personal and business brand accordingly. And I'm wondering if you can just talk about that as a business decision. Well, it was just, you know, when you have your own business, a lot of the time, I think, especially as a creative, they're mixed together, right? Like my business is me and I am my business. And just like the title Nomad Architect, (laughs) it just happened when I was in this one workshop, then I had to write on a piece of paper, what do I do? And I just wrote Nomad Architect. And then I looked at it and it's like, that actually tells the story of who I am and what I do. (laughs) <laughs> but, you know, the one thing I noticed is that people are not hiring me in spite of being a nomad. They hire me because I'm a nomad. Whenever you want to design a project that is for nomads or for travelers or for world citizens, you want to have someone who has the right mindset. And clearly I have it. So why should, like, it's not something that I need to hide. It's part of my identity and part of the common grounds that I have with my clients. And also like nowadays I'm doing this rebranding thing where actually going to call my new brand, the new movement. And the new movement is really about what is happening in the world and about the design philosophy that is behind what I do. Like, okay, nomad is how I live my life and architect it's who I am, but what do you get out of it as a client? And there's this new movement of things that's happening in the world. There's like the location independent movement and people are really starting to re-own their life and take their freedom to move around and to structure their life the way they want it to be. And they also structure their homes and their projects and their buildings. They want it to be and not the way it's supposed to be. And I want you to be able to talk a little bit more about that as well, because I know you've put a lot of thought and all of your experiences and everything that you've had so far, both professionally and personally with your travel, and you've put them all into this you know, in terms of your vision for what you're offering, right? Mm -hmm. And what differentiates the new movement. So can you talk a little bit about your philosophy about what the new movement is all about in terms of your architectural approach? Yeah, sure. So uh, let's say the new movement is based on my thoughts of the world and the way I see how architecture should be built. So there are two main aspects of it. It's people and places. So for example, there is one pillar of the new movement. It's called deciphering the memory palette. And I believe that every person has its own unique memory palette, which means your memories, your background, the things that you find inspiring. It's very individual. And as architects, we can't treat all the people in the same way because we all have our different backgrounds and our different cultural context. So then when you try to weave in those stories into the space, this is where we use the memory palette. And on the other hand, we have the site-specific aspect of the thing. Each place is so unique. And when you travel a lot, you really get sensitive to this fact. And unfortunately, we can see a lot of the new buildings that are being built worldwide looking exactly the same, following design trends and trying to do something that looks modern and new and chic. But the places that we find fascinating the most, the places that really resonate in us, they're the ones that use their uniqueness and expresses us, whether if it's using local materials or crafts or techniques, or just being in harmony with the local heritage and the places that we live in. Can you talk a little bit more about your concept of integrating technology and naturality and sort of the whole way that you're transforming the power of space in that context? The spaces that we spend time in, they affect us. There is a huge impact on humans. Let's say the height of the ceiling. The height of the ceiling has like you have, you can read many, many studies about it, that it affects our creativity. And then when you understand that as an architect, you have enormous power in shaping 
like the spaces that people live in and how it affects their lives, then you have to really take into consideration what is it that you do. And a lot of the time, yeah, I'm talking about natural materials. I'm talking about ancient wisdom and about local techniques, but I'm not afraid of technology, right? Technology is here to serve us. So when you strive to have this kind of simplicity of natural resources, but then you also have to have the mindset of openness towards the technology and the new things that are being developed. For example, there's a company in Italy who 3D print houses, maybe you've heard of it. And the innovative thing about what they do is they, they will send you a container with their 3D printer anywhere around the world and where you can use the local soil because it's a clay, it, they print clay, use the local soil and print your house from the earth where your house is going to be built in, which is amazing. It's mind blowing. Wow. That's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about some of your other projects that you have done that have, you know, stood out to you or been particularly memorable around the world? Yeah, sure. Let's see. Last year, I designed a yoga retreat center in Guatemala, which was, oh God, have you been to Guatemala? You know what? I have not. <gasps> I've been to Nicaragua oh. and I've been to Costa Rica, so but I have not yet been to Guatemala. I know I've been right there. I've, <laughs> it's been very high on my list. I want to do this like Central American trip where I spend an extended amount of time and just do like El Salvador and mm. Honduras and Guatemala and just kind of spend a bunch of time in that region because it's a place that I have not spent enough time. But I would love to hear oh, about what your experience was like there. Yeah, you have to go to Guatemala. It's so magical. Especially uh, there's a lake called Atitlan, which is surrounded by volcanoes and Mayan people. And there are like different villages around the lake and each village had their own like unique textiles and it's really cool. And you, you move around with boats. So then I went there and on, I met this couple and they wanted, they just bought a land and they want to do a yoga retreat center there. And it's like this stunning, amazing view. I think it's like every architect's dream to design a project in a place like this, because all you have to do is really frame the view in the best possible way. Like you don't compete with nature. <laughs> and then they did this amazing ceremony and they invited me to. Do you know how when you start a new project in the Western world, in the modern world, and you want to break ground, uh, you usually do it with shovels and bulldozers, right? Right. So then in Guatemala, in the Mayan tradition, there's a ceremony that you do where you ask permission from the land and you bless the land before you start designing the project, before you start digging, before doing anything. So what they did, they invited this shaman and a few friends and me to sit there for a few hours and we had cacao and they were singing and it was such a beautiful ceremony. And I was completely amazed by this different culture approach towards like the beginning of a new project. It's so gentle. It's so delicate. That's amazing. That's awesome. And then you did another project nearby in Costa Rica as well, right? Yeah, no, I actually didn't design this project. I just went there to brainstorm with a, a group of founders, which was really cool. This is actually a really cool story because I, I couldn't believe that it's real <laughs> until I actually got there. So a group of people reached out to me on LinkedIn. And then we had a Skype call of 10 minutes and they invited me and they're like, we would like to invite you to Costa Rica. And I was like, seriously? Okay, cool. Uh, what are we going to do there? And say, so, yeah, we just bought this amazing land in the South of Costa Rica by the beach. And they want to do this eco resort there. Well, after I learned that they already had two architects before me and they didn't like their designs because they felt like it was too harsh on the place. And they just, they love this place so much. It's a tiny village and they want to do something that really would be part of the place that it's not going to ruin it. So what they did, they invited me and another 20 people from all over the world, scientists, artists, developers, designers, yoga teachers. And we all spent there eight days and we explored around, we studied the area and we brainstormed the project and we kind of like saw what the feel that we get from the land. And I think it's a great way to start a project. 
to be there to really get the essence of the place and then start drafting. That's amazing. It's so incredible. So when you think back about all of your travels that you've done up to this point in your life and all of these different experiences, and you reflect on that, how would you say that your travels have impacted you, both in terms of you know your architectural approach, how they impacted that, and also how have they impacted you personally? Travel drastically changed my life. And like not only that my design studio became international and I get to do amazing, amazing, amazing projects with amazing people, uh, it really changed me in a way that I'm allowed to express myself in the most vivid way you can imagine. The other day, somebody asked me, what is freedom to me? And I said that freedom is when I wake up in the morning and I get to choose how my day looks like. And I get to choose who do I want to spend time with? What is my community of choice? And where do I live? I think it forces you to take ownership on your choices. It's like it, nothing is structured. Everything you do is a choice. And then you live a life that is very mindful. And yeah, sometimes it's hard and it gets lonely and everything, but it's also incredible. And yeah, traveling, I can't wait to go back traveling. <laughs> It's been so hard <laughs> staying in one place. <laughs> <laughs> so pre-COVID, let me just ask you this, yeah. I, because I know you've been a full-time itinerant nomad with no base for many years, which I have as well. And I'm very impressed with people that do that because a lot of people, they maybe they try it out for a little bit. And then within a year or less, they're kind of back, you know, to a place and, or, you know, wasn't the right fit for them or they didn't you know, attend to all of the long-term sustainability pillars that are required to, you mm -hmm. know, maintain this lifestyle in an effective way and all that. So I'm curious though, for you, cause you've been able to do this for many, many years. What for you have been the primary sustainability pillars mm -hmm. that have allowed you to not just create this life, but sustain it in a healthy and fulfilling way? Yeah. Okay. So it took me a while to understand what works for me. So one of the decisions that I made that really made traveling easier for me was to balance new places and places that I already know and love and want to go back to. Because I, I realized that it's very emotionally challenging every month or every two months to be thrown into a new reality. You're a stranger in a new country, in a new culture. You have to figure out what to eat and where to sleep and what to do and where do you have the, the best cafes and with the good Wi-Fi and the nice staff. <laughs> and it's, it's very energy consuming. So I'm, I'm also a slow man by definition. I'm not one of these nomads that hop on a plane every week. I love to spend time in places. I love to get to know the neighbors and make friends and go to the same cafe place every day. And also like I had this decision of like, okay, once in a while I'll go on adventure to a place where I don't know anyone, but I'll also be like, oh, you know what? Maybe I'll go to Lisbon for two months and then go on, you know, because there I have a community and I have friends and I don't have to start from scratch. So this is one insight that I had to understand. And also I think when you go on this journey, you really have to develop your core, your inner world and the self-care routines and just have this kind of like anchor that works for you. So for me, it's yoga. I wake up every day and do my 30 minutes of yoga followed by 10 or 15 minutes of meditation. And it, no matter where I am, I know that this is the way my day starts. And it's very peaceful and very grounding you know, to have this kind of routine that you chose for yourself because, you know, it's benefiting you. Yeah, I agree. I think that's awesome. And I think those anchors that you can create and maintain in your life that are the same, no matter where you are. And each time you go to a new place and you have those anchors in your life, I think that definitely helps out a lot. So what is your optimal travel structure? Like how long do you typically stay in each place and how do you choose the places that you're going to go next? Mm -hmm. Ideally, I would spend at least one month 
in a place. Sometimes if I have a, you know, a connection flight, let's say I flew to the Philippines through Hong Kong. Yeah, I spent five days in Hong Kong just because I was already there. Why not? But I'll try and stay at least a month. And if I like it, I'll stay longer. You know, I'm, I'm not about moving very fast. I, I love staying in places. But sometimes it just feels like it's time to go. It's either that winter starts. <laughs> so it's time to follow the sun again, like the birds. Or sometimes it's visa issues or it just feels like you want to do something different. So you just, I think that's the beauty of living this kind of life. You can just wake up and say, okay, I think I'm done here. Let's go somewhere else. And just, and then, you know, hop on a plane and go for it. <laughs> That's amazing. Although you don't always go to sunny places, right? I mean, you have been to Japan in the wintertime in the ski season. That's the one exception. <laughs> That's right? the one exception. <laughs> because it's Japan. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's amazing. I can be in winter for like a week or two and then I get too cold and I have to go somewhere else. You know, I'm Israeli. Winter in Israel is not really winter. It's also sunny. And it's not so cold. I I don't do very well with cold weather. (laughs) Right. Understood. (laughs) So I also want to ask you a little bit more when you started talking about your daily routines. Mm -hmm. Can you go a little bit deeper into that? Because I'm also curious as an entrepreneur, right? Because the other sustainability pillar of this entire lifestyle is that you need to be able to make money and run an effective business to finance your lifestyle. Right. And I feel like that's one of the mistakes that people make is they're just like, they travel to these epic places and they just want to go and do all this cool stuff. And they don't actually do enough work because building a business and running a business is an enormous time consuming endeavor, right? Yeah. To especially to do it well. And so I would love to hear from you and what your sort of productivity techniques are. What does your day structure or your week structure look like where you're able to produce the amount of, of output that you do mm-hmm. to run an effective business? Yeah. So first of all, I think one of the things that I learned having my own business is that you really have to pay attention to your focus hours. For example, I am not a morning person. Working nine to five, which actually in Israel, it's like eight to six (laughs) because architecture firms, just you know, you work all day. I'm not effective until like 10 a.m. or 11. I'm just useless in the morning. It's much better if I'll go somewhere else, go to the museum, walk around, get inspired. And then when I'm really focused and really awake to do core work, then it's better to do it. So I had to study the way that my focus and the creativity levels flow is structured in me. And then I just adjust the time that I work to it. So let's say I love working in the night. I I don't know. There's something about the night that makes creativity blossom. You know, I I love working into the night. If I'm inspired, I'll just keep working until, I don't know, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. I don't care. So the, the reason that I can do it is because I'm allowing myself to wake up late if I want to. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I definitely know what you mean because I am very... <laughs> yeah, you're not dial as well. <laughs> I am not a morning person, so I understand oh 100%. I'm so jealous at those people when they wake up at 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. all fresh and ready to start their day. This is totally not me. I tried. It's, it's just not the way I'm built. Adi, though, you know what is the advantage to our sleep cycle yeah. and our hours is that when the weekend comes around, you're ready to go out till three in the morning. Like you're all set. You're on the same cycle, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Whereas those morning people that are getting up at 7 a.m., you know, they're like exhausted by 10 p.m. And we're just like heading out to the nightlife, you know, yeah. and they're like on their way to sleep. So yeah. That's true. It's some good consistency there. You got to look. See, I've studied these silver linings and these upsides. I'm like, okay, not a morning person. How can I benefit from that? <laughs> right? so. and, and when you work, when you're an employee, you have to go through like the normal working hours. But when you have your own business, especially yeah. if you move between different time zones, nobody expects you to be up and ready in 8 a.m. You can reply whenever, right. you know, you don't have to use synchronized communication. You can just do it whenever it uh, yeah. feels right. And I think on a serious note, to your point, the understanding of your own focus 
hours and your own optimal work hours is really the key, right? I mean, I have yeah. interviewed people on this podcast that are super morning people, right? Mm -hmm. And the advantage for them is that they'll literally get up at five o'clock in the morning. They will do all of their work starting at 5.30 a.m. And by noon, they will be done and finished for the day. Mm -hmm. And then they just spend the entire afternoon, you know, doing their social stuff, hanging out or whatever. And of course, they're going to bed at 8.30 or 9 p.m. <laughs> but for them, that works. Yeah. And for them also, they were working a nine to five. That's four hours of work that they finished before 9 a.m. That is for them is their optimal work hour. So, yeah. literally if it's even if it's the inverse of what you and I are describing because you and I are probably going to sleep at the time they're getting up <laughs> some nights right but that's the whole point right is that you have control over your life and you're able to optimize your lifestyle to your personal preferences yeah. when you're best at putting in your work hours you can structure your life around that okay so the second thing I wanted to say about the productivity thing so other than doing work for clients big part of being an entrepreneur and having your own business is to have long-term projects, which always gets to like the end of, of the list, right? You never get have time for it. And it's always like low priority. So the thing that I did, it's, I actually learned it from one of my friends, my, my nomadic friends is to have accountability buddy where you set your goals and you maybe have it in a shared doc or something. And then once a week, you'll have a one hour call to kind of like hold each other accountable on those goals. And then you have to do it, right? You commit to do something and then you have to do it by next week. And if not, we just kick each other's ass. And it's wonderful because, you know, it, it could be a very lonely journey being a solo entrepreneur. But then when you have a community of entrepreneurs that support each other, it's amazing. 100% agree with that. I think that's super important. I also want to ask you about your stress management techniques. You mentioned a little bit earlier about the mindfulness and about your yoga practice. And I'd love to just kind of open that up for you. Also, if there's anything else you want to add, because being an entrepreneur, in addition to being lonely, can also be very stressful because the, mm. there is this concept of the entrepreneurial roller coaster that all business owners know, and it goes up and then sometimes it goes down, right? And when yeah. it goes down, it can be very, very, very stressful. And I'm mm -hmm. curious how you manage stress as a business owner, what techniques you have for that? Okay. So other than my daily routine of yoga and meditation, sometimes if I say that my mind is really occupied, I'll do 10 minutes of dancing or 20 minutes. Uh, do you practice yoga? I have done yoga before. I do not maintain it as a regular daily practice at the okay. moment, although I probably should because <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, because there's something about being present in the body that kind of like takes you off your mind and your thoughts and just being obsessive about things that you have to get done when you're really present in the moment. And being in the body means to be present in the moment because for the body, there is no other choice but being present in the moment. That really helps to take the stress away. And there's a practice called yoga nidra, which is practically a deep yogi sleep. It's a, almost like a guided meditation when you go through your body and be aware of different parts of the body and relax them. And I have this recording of this really cute Indian lady that she, it takes 20 minutes. And it, after you do it, it feels like two hours of sleep, seriously. It just wakes up. You just wake wow. up from this meditation feeling so energized and so calm. So you can just get through the day. We were taught that multitasking is, is a thing. Actually, monotasking is what we really need to be doing. And just do one thing at a time and not over stress ourselves over doing too many things at the same time because it's, it's impossible. You have to set realistic goals I know that I have uh, 1 million ideas at any given moment. It's, it's insane. And I have this notebook with me and I also keep notes on my phone. And another thing is that I outsource a lot of the work. I let my team quite a lot and I'm focusing on the creative part of the work, uh, which is what I'm good at. So yeah. if you have the possibility to, to collaborate, to outsource, to delegate, some of your to-do lists and have more free time, that's long-term sustainability, like self-care. 
100%. That is awesome advice. All right, Adi, at this point, are you ready to move in to the lightning round? Yes, please. Let's do it. The lightning round. What is one book that has significantly influenced you over the years that you would most recommend to people? The Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander. He's a British American architect and he has this beautiful philosophy about places that has special quality in them. And in this book, he he presents his philosophy and this book really changed my mind about how and what architecture could be like. So yeah, if you like architecture, you should definitely read it. Amazing. What is one travel hack that you use that you can recommend to people? Whenever I go to a new place and I want to know new people and I want to meet friends, mostly when I want to know local people. So instead of renting my own apartment, I'll rent a room in a shared apartment. And then a lot of the time we become friends and we go around together, we go get drinks with their friends and we go to music concerts together and they give you all the best tips of where to buy your vegetables. And so if you want to mix which is yeah, kind of like the purpose of traveling. You know, mix with local people. Don't get your own apartment. Just get a room in a shared apartment. Awesome. If you could have dinner with any person who is currently alive today that you've never met, who would you choose? Mm, back to Christopher Alexander, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I really want to talk to this guy. He's incredible. All right. So I have to ask you an architecture question here for the lightning round. I'm going to ask you to name your top three favorite architects of all time. They can be living or dead, doesn't Mm. matter, but all time favorite top three architects. Okay. The first one would be Frank Lloyd Wright. I bet you know him. Yep. Yeah. He has this amazing project called Falling Water in Pennsylvania. Absolutely amazing. The second one will be Tarawando. He's a Japanese architect. And when I, oh, next time you go to Japan, I'm going to send you to one of this project. Have you been to the art islands? I have been to Naoshima. All yes. right. Have you been to the Tichiro Museum, the underground museum? Yes, absolutely. <gasps> oh my God. Okay. You're the first person I talked to who's been to this museum other than myself. Isn't it amazing? It is amazing. It's amazing. So it's designed by Tarawando. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There you go. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Naoshima was an amazing island. I mean, it is just really, really spectacular. I mean, his art installations all over the entire island. And then of course, this museum is like the centerpiece of it. It's a really spectacular place. Yeah. Yeah. So Tararondo, and then the third one would be Gaudi, clearly. Although I was thinking between him and the Egyptian architect Hassan Fatri, which is also, he's amazing. I don't know if you know his work. What were some of the major projects that he designed? So his design concept is to do architecture for the people. And he realized that he kind of like revived the whole building from earth concept in Egypt. And designing houses that are for the poor, but they're completely passive. So you don't have to have electricity in order to have ventilation or heating in the winter. So just using local techniques and ancient wisdom. He was doing a lot of projects there in the 50s. And his work is amazing. You can find some online books of him. Even some of them are like free in PDF format. And you can see the plans. And he's really incredible. Wow, that is awesome. I've actually spent about a year in Egypt. <gasps> I lived in Cairo. Wow. I've been to Egypt about three times. And I lived in my longest stay in Cairo was for nine months, Wow, uh, which was back in 2014. And yeah, I mean, I've also obviously, I mean, I've traveled other places in Egypt. I've been up to Alexandria. I've been down to Aswan and Luxor and a lot of those other spots. So I've spent a lot of time in Egypt and I have a lot of love for Egypt. But yeah, that's amazing. I mean, we're going to link up all four of those that I'm giving you four architects. We're going to link <laughs> them all up in the show notes all right. so that folks can go check them out and, and check out their work. Which leads me to the next lightning round question, which is of all of the places that you have ever traveled in your life, what are your top three? three favorite travel destinations that you'd most recommend to people? So you already know Japan is high, high on my list. (laughs) The second one would be Portugal. 
and Morocco. I can't wait to go back to Morocco. Nice. I've spent about a month or so in Morocco. What is your favorite place in Morocco? So hard to say. Favorite place in I'll Morocco. I'll tell you what mine is. Yeah, tell me yours. I'll tell you what mine is. My favorite place in Morocco that I'm recommending to people is Asuera on the uh, coast. It's like mm -hmm. maybe just a little bit north of Tagzout, which is kind of this surfing place. That a lot of people go to Tagzout, mm -hmm. but uh, Asuera is this just absolutely magical, you know, it's basically like a fishing village, but it is just like unbelievable. Like you talk about, you know, energy and stuff of different places, mm -hmm. you know, when you walk into them and they feel a particular way. I mean, this place is just truly magical. So I, I tell everybody, I mean, that's mm -hmm. fine. Like go into Marrakesh, like spend some time there, like see the big cities or, and things like that if you want to. Like, I mean, I also, I've been to Marrakesh, I've been to Casablanca, I've been to Tangier, I've been mm -hmm. to those kind of places, but this particular village on the coast is mm -hmm. just, I mean, it blew me away. It's my favorite place in the country. Wow. That's amazing. I actually really liked Marrakesh, you know, yeah. I prepared myself to kind of like hate it because a lot of people told me that it's very hard to be a tourist in Marrakesh and people just keep like asking me to buy stuff from them. But I found it to be so magical. And as an architect, I wanted to see as many Riyadhs as I can, right? Because uh, you probably stayed in a Riyadh, this courtyard house that are now boutique hotels. Right. So I found myself just knocking on doors. You have like the doors to the street. There is like no front yard or anything. So you have a door in the middle of the street. And when you knock on it and you open the door, there's like a whole world inside this different types of uh, oasis. So I spend a lot of my time in markets just knocking on random doors and asking to have a look and having tea with people and talking about the history of the building. So that was an incredible experience for me. That's awesome. The one place I have not been in Morocco that is super high on my list is Chef Shawin, mm. which is sort of like the, you know, known as like the blue city. Have you been out there? No, no, I haven't. I, I, I have to go back to Morocco. Easy as that. All right. So final lightning round question. I want to ask you about your top three bucket list destinations. These are places that you've never been that are the highest on your list you would most love to see. Mm, okay. Um, so I haven't been to any of the Scandinavian countries. I was supposed to go this summer, but you know what happened? I really want to see the Scandinavian design and to get like the atmosphere of this place. And also there's a long dream of mine, a lifelong dream of mine to be in Mongolia, which I haven't been. And to go to Bali, because unfortunately as an Israeli, I can't enter Indonesia, but hopefully it will be solved soon. <laughs> so I'll be, I'll be able to go there. Well, I went to Mongolia last year. So Aww. when you are ready to go, oh, yeah, I'll tell you the really amazing way that, that I did it though, is I took the Trans-Siberian Railway oh, from God. Moscow all the way across Siberia to Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia. Wow. And then I did it with a whole bunch of nomads. We had like 30 nomads and we did this journey together. And so <gasps> wow. we got like the 30 day visa to Russia, right? So we went up and we spent time in St. Petersburg and Moscow to see the cities. And then the journey across Siberia was about two weeks because we would stop in these really amazing cities. I mean, I talk about like incredible architecture, like you are just going to, I mean, love some of these places. And then we ended up in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. And then we spent time in, in that city. And then we went across the Gobi Desert. And we were like going on camels and staying oh, in yurts wow. and, you know, doing all that. So there's still other parts of Mongolia that I would love to see that I haven't seen. Like it has some of the most epic natural landscape probably in the world. And oh, I wow. haven't seen a lot of it, but I did get to spend some time in the Gobi Desert. And it was actually really cool because the Mongolians, I mean, those are some of the original nomads <laughs> yeah. in the world, Hardcore right? Nomads. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. So like, it was really incredible because we actually got to spend some time with some local Mongolian families. And of course they speak zero English. You know, but we had a <laughs> Mongolian guide that was, that was bilingual and was able to translate. So they like invited us into their yurt, you know, where they live. Wow. And we were able to talk to them and literally just like asking them, 
all the questions about the nomad lifestyle. We're like, teach us, like, tell us how to do this. We're sort of these digital nomads, but you're like the OGs, like, tell us how to really do this lifestyle. So it was amazing. It was a really fun cultural exchange. It was really cool. And, you know, the Gobi Desert was just oh, insanely wow. gorgeous. I mean, it was a really beautiful place and special. How about you go explore uh, those other parts of Mongolia that you haven't been to together? What do you think? Listen, I'm down a hundred percent. And then after that, we'll be in Asia. So we can just go skiing in Japan after that. <laughs> and I see the future. As soon as COVID is over, I'm in 100%. Yay. Perfect. All right. Deal. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right. So at the, at this point, I want you to talk a little bit about your upcoming projects. I know you're doing some really cool stuff with tiny houses and I'd love for you to talk about that. And if there's any listeners that are interested in how they can connect with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I don't know how many of our listeners are familiar with the concept of tiny houses, but tiny houses are basically self-sustained units that you can tow around in your car that are, it's a huge movement in the US, in Canada, and in Australia that starts from the understanding that modern slaves are in debt and not in chains, right? This whole movement started from people who want to live tiny. They want to be more minimalist and have more experiences like we do. And they don't want to have huge mortgages in their houses. But a lot of the people can't really go into this lifestyle 100%, but they do want to experience it as a vacation rental or to spend some time in a tiny house as a writer's retreat or just have this kind of unit that they can tow around and have their vacations in. So in the past few months, I've been developing a few designs for tiny houses because as a minimalist, a traveler and an architect, I have quite a unique perspective of what a unit like this should have and what kind of experience we can have for guests in this kind of thing. So I'm about to launch my tiny house brand. And I was thinking to offer the listeners of the show a special deal on building the prototypes. So the unit itself is going to cost something around $80,000 where it's completely self-sustained and with the best materials that can be found. And uh, we're aiming to build it as locally as possible. So wherever in the U.S., at the moment only for the States, wherever your property is, we're going to find the nearest builder. It's going to use locally sourced materials to build high quality units. And what I'm offering is to customize the design and just to oversee the whole process of the construction with you. And then you'll have your own tiny house vacation rental unit that you can use to have to make another income from. That is amazing. So let me just clarify this. So this is, for example, in the United States primarily, right? Yeah. Anybody that has a piece of land or wants to buy a piece of land, you can literally buy a small piece of land in a super epic, beautiful location. And it doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't have to have utilities hooked up. It doesn't have to be developed land mm -hmm. because you are creating a completely self-sustainable tiny house, which can be put on land anywhere that somebody owns the land, right? Yeah. And then it's just completely self-sustainable with energy and everything else. It does not have to have external utilities at all, correct? Correct. In these current times, a lot of the people like we do, well, can't travel internationally or there is like increase in demand for domestic tourism. And a lot of the people, they're looking to do this kind of like a city escape where they go to nature and they want to be closer to the nature reserves or just being beautiful places and kind of like get away from the stress and the noise of the city. And when you have like, and a lot of the time developing these kind of properties is quite challenging because you don't know how to connect them and it could be quite expensive to develop the land itself. But if your units are self-sustained, you can just put them anywhere. That's incredible. And then as you mentioned, because we've got a lot of real estate investors that listen to the show as well, as you mentioned, you could then use this as a short-term 
rental property and lease it out by the night on Airbnb or a platform like that and actually have it as both a personal use situation when you wanted to use it yourself and then also lease it out as a short term rental when you're not using it. And, you know, I think what you mentioned about the timing is incredible because particularly during covid People are, A, not trying to get on planes and travel internationally, but B, also, you know, trying to get away from the city and get out in nature and, you know, connect with really cool experiences in increasingly remote places. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like you've checked all the boxes. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about this project. I love tiny living and just to be able to have this gorgeous hotel room in the middle of nowhere. I think it's epic. That is really epic. So, okay. So if any Maverick Show listeners want to get involved in something like that for themselves, and they're interested in having you design and oversee their construction of their tiny home, how do they contact you? How do they get more information about that? And can you give the Maverick Show listeners some kind of uh, special early bird deal for coming to you through the Maverick Show? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the best way to contact me is through my website, which is currently adicoinarchitect.com, but soon it will be uh, the new MVT, like the new movement.com, or through my Instagram page, which is nomad.architect.me. And all you have to do is just mention that you come through the Maverick Show and I'll get you a very special deal on the design and the whole process, which is now going to be 7,000 US dollars instead of 11. Nice. Okay. So you're going to get a discount off of the design and then they're basically going to be able to get the construction at cost. So depending on exactly which plan they pick, that can vary depending on which design plan they pick, but then you're just going to be able to oversee that at the builder cost and you can help them with the construction. But the design fee that they're paying you for is going to be at that discounted rate if they come through the Maverick Show, which is awesome. (laughs) We are going to link up those websites and that contact info in the show notes, folks. So you can just go to one place at themaverickshow.com and you can check out Adi's website, which by the way, you should check out anyways. I mean, it's really (laughs) impressive and interesting just to see the type of work she's doing. And also, I think for anybody that's interested in starting their own business or merging the way that you've merged your nomadic lifestyle with your business, in your brand. I think that's one of the really fascinating things that you have done and you have done it very well and you've done it very effectively. So for anybody that's even just looking at how do I merge my nomadic lifestyle, my location independent travel lifestyle with my business brand, I think your website is a fantastic example for how to do it and how to do it effectively. So I wanna encourage everybody to just check out your site. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your words. Yeah, for real. I mean, absolutely. And so all that stuff is going to be in the show notes at one place at themaverickshow.com. Adi, I want to thank you so much for being here. This was awesome to have you on the show. And now we have our first post-COVID trip planned. We're going to go Yay. to Mongolia and then we're going, oh to, going to go skiing in Japan. So I can't it's, wait. It's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for having it's, me. I had a blast. And I also, I want to say that I really appreciate the fact that you opened a bottle of wine just for having this episode with me. <laughs> I opened a bottle of wine about 60 to 90 minutes after I woke up in the morning uh, for this episode. <laughs> so, and I have to say, I've made some very, very good progress on it as we've gone through the episode. So uh, the rest of my day is looking very, very good uh, at this point. Thanks to you, Adi. So this was awesome. You were an amazing guest. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Have a great day. All right. Good night or good morning, everybody, <laughs> wherever you are. <laughs> Be sure to visit the show notes page at themaverickshow.com for direct links to all the books, people, and resources mentioned in this episode. You'll find all that and much more at themaverickshow.com. Learn how Maverick Investor Group can help you buy cash-flowing rental properties in the best U.S. real estate markets, regardless of where you live. 
Schedule a free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com slash consult. Now you can buy rental properties with tenants and local property management in place so you don't have to be a landlord or a rehabber. To get your questions answered and discuss how Maverick Investor Group can help you meet your real estate investing goals, schedule your free phone consult today at themaverickshow.com forward slash consult. If you like podcasts, you will love audiobooks, and you can get your first one for free at themaverickshow.com slash audiobook. Whether you 